place to kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> our God and our Father who art in heaven, King of kings, Lord of lords, Lord of the universe, our creator, our redeemer, and our savior. Jehovah God, we kneel humbly before thee, in this sanctuary to thank you firstly for the gift of life and the many blessings that have you bestowed upon us throughout this day. Lord, we want to thank you how you kept us ever since you were here last evening for this series of talks on thy word. Father, we thank you for thy word, thy sure word of eternal life. May you help us to eternalize and understand. May the Spirit, Holy Spirit give us the spirit of discernment that we may be able to understand and see thy plan of salvation for each and every one of us here present. May you hasten the feet of even those who are yet to join us that, Lord, when we live here, we may remember that surely we were before thee. May you be thy servant who has been taking us through. May you use him mightily. May you touch his brain self that, Lord, he may communicate that which is coming from thee and that will help us to grow and that will help us to develop a healthy relationship in our family life. Thank you, Lord, for the preparation that is there and thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us in the past. As we now go into this series of uh, discussions, dear Father. May thy will be done in our lives and may it be, make it closer to you at the end of the entire program. For this is our humble prayer. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, once more. Uh, it's time for our special reading, and uh, it comes, uh, it's titled Marriage, a Lifelong Covenant. It reads, when a man and a woman marry, they enter into a covenant with each other, with society, and with God to be faithful to one another until death. This we get from Proverbs 2 verse 17 and Malachi 2 verse 14. As the gospel is experienced in marriage, the relationship of the partners with each other is fashioned after the likeness of the divine covenant with humility. Uh, this we get from Psalms 89 verse 34 and Lamentations chapter 3 verse 23. They are to love, serve, and forgive as he loves, serves, and forgives. This we get from John 15 verse 12 and Matthew chapter 20 verse 26 to 28. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 23, and Titus chapter 2, verse 4, and lastly, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. The couple draws strength from the pro 
visions made in the divine covenant. God promising grace and power to enable them to do what they could not do on their own. His covenanted love needs together what sin separates, Colossians 2 verse 2. This covenant with the cross of Christ at, at its center makes, makes possible the intimate union of a man and a woman in marriage. This is support. As the cross is uplifted, spouse who, the spouse who has become alienated may be brought near to God and to each other. The blood of Jesus breaks down the walls of hostility that the enemy has built up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 to 14. Um, that's our reading for today. Amen. Uh, I'd, now, I'd like to invite the youth choir for a special item. Oh, play. 
I just want to just want to use the opportunity and say to the seniors of the church or to convey to the seniors of the church the assurance that was expressed just a few minutes ago just in case you missed it the church the future of the church is in safe hands they didn't just sing they made a commitment we will carry the torch you know there are times when seniors see sometimes the younger ones who you know sometimes you wonder what's wrong with these young people don't you know seniors where i'm talking sometimes they wonder why this one behaves that way and but let us remember we were there too and there are some of us who are in leadership now who the seniors then wondered about <laughs> true or false praise the lord they just made it very clear don't worry about us we'll carry the torch amen, amen church by the grace of god let us support them amen. did i say support yes. you caught that didn't you did i say no. <laughs> okay we're in the same wavelength i can see that i can see that uh so having said what i said about the youth i just want to reaffirm my anticipation in uh, the opportunity to see them those who will be as available to meet with me on sunday morning as announced look forward to that may i just remind you too that we're keeping our promise as it relates to the special prayer that those of you who are exercising your faith and placing your prayer requests in the box in the boxes we will be having that very prayer, special prayer session on sabbath so please continue to uh, put your prayer request therein uh, just to say that over these few days they ran very fast didn't they give the lord thanks i i have been blessed I want you to hear me clearly. Dolores and I have been blessed being able to connect with you. And we have had the privilege, including this afternoon, I just want to tell those who responded to the invitation to come and connect with us in a professional, uh, private, personal way thank you for uh, validating our service if no one had come we would have wondered whether the service was of any value we appreciate the fact that there are those of you who sought to come and have one and one with me and by god's grace we'll continue tomorrow at the same time at two o'clock for those whose appointments have been made uh, as it relates to any further on, we will speak to that in the process of time. So we have been really blessed being here so far, and we thank the Lord for that. I just want to acknowledge the presence of those who are just joining us. First time. Well, I tell you something, the Bible talks about the 11th hour Christian or the 11th hour worker that is to say in as much as you are just coming in at this 11th hour you're going to get 100 percent just the same isn't that something and those of us who have been here before don't you get jealous your 100 percent is equally secured that's what the lord says as long as you come with an open heart you'll get your full 100 
Praise the Lord. We've been talking about um, family relational health. And you know that there's a statement I put on screen each time which says that the presentations are designed to teach and uphold Christian biblical ideals, ideals of good family life. At the same time, we're aware that there might be personal, social, national, cultural, and other realities that could make it challenging for some persons and families to identify with and embrace all these ideals so that in the event of the presentation anything is presented that cuts a grain against your perspective culturally socially or personally it's not intended to aim at you it's intended to present the straight word of the lord and therefore we want to make sure we don't compromise we say it out as God would have us say it. We've been talking about relational health. And I am going to make a very brisk review of the main points of the four that we looked at. The question on how healthy is the relationships? I pluralize it now. How healthy are the relationships that you are in. Whether it be marital, parental, social, business, collegial, sibling, uh, uh, whatever. Once you are in a sustained relationship with someone, whatever be its nature, that relationship ought to be preserved healthily. We know, however, that because we are human beings, we're still living in a world of sin, all of us being born in sin and shape and iniquity, and that the mystery of iniquity continues to work, then we know that relationships do get unhealthy at times. True or false? To the same extent that the body gets unhealthy, relationships can. We spoke about the physiological health, which covers our physical, anatomical, the hormones, the chemicals, and the neurological aspect of our being, the body, fearfully and wonderfully made. It would take us so many more sessions to cover each of these, a presentation each time, how the body is marvelously made. But because this is not a presentation that is intended to focus on our physiological health, then we balance out by saying there's another aspect of health that we need to pay equal attention to. What is that aspect, brothers and sisters? Our psychological health. I just rushed through those four vital signs. Maybe I should go back over them. So when we talk about the body, those are the vital signs of the body that the medical practitioner works with to give him or her an indication, indication, a cue, a hint, an idea as to how the body is functioning before he or she actually does any internal clinical assessment. Those vital signs are checked. And we said that the other aspect of our health, the psychological, which is the state and function of the mind, in it our spirituality, mentality, our emotions, social, and the focus is on our relationship, all those are in the mind. And we said that all human relationships begin and continue to exist in the mind. We are simply doing a quick look over on these. Then we said 
To the same extent that there are four vital signs that the medical practitioner checks to get a cue of the function of the state of the body, the psychologist, the counselor, the therapist who treats the mind in terms of relationship check four vital signs. And we have spent some time going through them, the connection, the rapport, the bond, and the support. We also pointed out that there are other aspects of health. And we zoomed in during the presentation on our psychosomatic health, which talks about the impact that the mind has on the body. Psycho, meaning the mind. Soma comes from Greek, which means the body. So we said that the mind is the engine of our B-E-I-N-G, the engine. It's the mind that drives the quality of our existence. And to a large extent, the state of our physiological health depends on the state and function of our mind. That is why during the course of this week we have been looking at that. I shared with you how critical psychosomatic illness is that you can be so affected if your relationships are not healthy. And I shared with you some of these, how anger can affect your liver and grief, the lungs, and we went through all of that. This is just a brisk review just to make a connection with what we're saying. Ultimately, the goal is we should balance our focus on the state of our body with the state of our mind. You cannot be healthy, healthy as God would have it, if we do not pay keen attention to the state of our mind. And by the way, I quickly must bring this in. I also saw to split hair between mental illness and relational illness. As a psychologist, I do not treat mental illness from a medical perspective because I do not administer drugs or medication to treat schizophrenia or paranoia or any of the compulsive obsessive disorders of the mind and brain and no. But one thing we emphasize is that a lot of mental illnesses are the result of relational illnesses that were not treated. When relationships are not well, it can throw your system off. So the focus of the week is pay serious God-given attention to the state of your relationships. Okay, having said that, I shared with you a few of the relational illnesses. And as you see some on screen, and there's so many more in my practice over 36 years. I have been treating these on and on wherever I go around the world. Because these are real illnesses. Illnesses. Illness. And when they are not treated, they throw off your entire B-E-I-N-G. Body and mind including your spirituality. So, we began breaking them down. We looked at the connection. We looked at rapport. Last night, we emphasized the bond, how critical it is. And tonight, 
we are going to be focusing on the support, the fourth vital sign. And the issue we want to deal with now is this. How unreservedly available 24-7 is the support from you to him or her or from her or him to you? How unreservedly available 24-7 is the support for your wife, for your husband, for your son, for your daughter, for your cousin, for your aunt, for your friend. Those significant person in your life, are you there for him or her 24-7? That's the issue. To get deep into this, I'm going to invite you to sing our consecration song. And Dolores is going to join me as we prepare our hearts to dig deep into this. Our consecration song, Open My Heart, Lord. Let's sing. Open my heart. I want to see Jesus to reach out and touch and say that I love him. Open my ears, Lord, and help me to listen. Open my eyes. Why? I want to Would you stand with us as we make the consecration commitment in the last stanza? We're going to pray and then we sing it to sit back down. Dolores, lift us up briefly before the Lord as we prepare for this presentation. Almighty Father, we come again to you. We want to say how thankful we are for your many mercies for your goodness. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And sometimes, Lord, we wish we had a more intensified word than just thank you. Mm. But Lord, you understand humans, and we want to say with all our hearts, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you for going to Calvary and died so that we can see you if we only trust you and believe you. And tonight again, we have come to open the word, and we ask, Lord, that you will strengthen your manservants. We ask that you will help us as individuals to open our minds so that the word can find lodgment and we can straighten up if we need to, so that indeed we can be with you. Oh Lord, thank you for taking care of us again. Thank you for all the supplies you have given. And you know our needs and we ask you tonight to fill those needs. And we ask you, Lord, to help your manservant to deliver what we believe is another great message, another strong message that we need eye solve to really wash our eyes so that we can see the realities. Help us as we live in these last days, closing hours of earth's history, so that indeed we can find favor with you when you come, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Open my mind, Lord. Give me understanding. Your will for my life now. And pour to transform me. This is a church. Give me the call to change what is me. Pray in your heart now as we sing. Come, Holy Spirit. Your words to inspire. Amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. So let's now, with that same open-mindedness, zoom in on the matter of support. Here's our anchor text. Let your conversation be without covetousness. By the way, this is verse 5. This an error there. That's verse 5, so you can correct it, please. And be content with such things as ye have. For he, that is the Lord, hath said, and I want to invite you now to read with me the bold green. What has he said? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, read with me, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I want you to notice the words we emphasize. I will never leave you or forsake you I'll be your helper. Here comes Proverbs 18, 24. Again, notice the emphatic words. A man that hath friends must show himself how? Friendly. But here's a big point. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Support. Support. Two key synonyms for the word support. And let me quickly remind you that when we use the word support in relationships, we're not limiting it to the giving. I always illustrate it this way. Well, at least you can't say I don't support you. Here, take it. Some family members limit the concept of support to material things. Um, I always remember this. I mean, I've had so many experiences in this issue, but this one stands out poignantly in my mind that day, decades ago, when I was principal for that high school, and that boy gave so much challenges at school. And his father was summoned. And when his father came into my office, he said, Principal, let me tell you something. This boy has no need. Listen to me, Principal. If you go into that boy's room, he has his own television. He has his own, and he ran the list of the things that the boy had, that he provided him, that he supported him with. But the boy sees him maybe once in so many months because he was never at home. The boy wasn't needing things. He needed his daddy. He needed him to be there to support him emotionally, socially, spiritually to be there. Am I coming clear? Yes. So support 
A synonym for that is care. That is to say, and by the way, let's begin the internal work immediately. Remember again, this is not academic. This is therapy. So it's intended to treat the mind. That's where I work. That's why the, the byline for family relational health services that Dolores and I operate, the byline is caring for relationships the healthy way. Treating relationships. So treat your mind now. When we talk about care, how much attention do you give to her, him, thought, sensitivity, there's the word itself, support. How much do you cherish, cherish your relationship, love, appreciate, concern, treat, consideration, and you can run your own list. Remember, while you take your notes, you have to be writing them in your mind because you're checking yourself. When you walk out of here this evening, you should leave here better than you came in because you have internalized something. You have taken some treatment. You have either reaffirmed the good relationship that you're in. Let me say that slowly. I am not of the assumption that there is no healthy relationship. God has never left his people without a witness. There are healthy, strong, bonded relationships seated right here now. Come on, say amen. amen. Because that's the truth. But you know, I shared this with someone. Do you know what is the largest room in the house? What's the largest room in the house? Anybody? Okay. Man, I wish I, I could bet you all some money and win you all tonight. Okay. The largest room in the house is the room for improvement. So it doesn't matter how well your relationship is, it still has room for? Praise the Lord. So there's none who should consider him or self. Oh, as Paul said, I don't speak. Okay, fine, let me borrow from Paul. I, Anthony Gordon, on behalf of Dolores, don't speak as one who has apprehended, as if to say, oh, well, we have made it. The last thing we would ever want you to do is to sit there, look at us up here, and say, oh, they have made it. Made what? We are simply making it. We have not made it. That's why I told you that we eat from the same pot out of which we're serving you. Anything I present to you, when we go back home, we stir up the pot and eat out of it too to ensure that you don't get healthy and we stay unhealthy. Okay? Another word, another synonym for support can you call that for me? And remember, this is therapy. <laughs> you know where I'm going, Pastor. I know you, you catch it so quickly. It's not compassion. What is it, church? I want you to go down now and come back up. What is it? Compassion. Say it and feel it. Compassion. That's why God gave you emotion. Don't allow your intelligence to stifle your emotion. Come on, brethren, fellow men, let's use our base right. It's not compassion, but it's compassion. What does it mean? Sympathy, empathy, kindness, benevolence, kind-heartedness, goodwill, generosity, altruism. Munificence, these are characteristics of a compassion.
compassionate, supportive family member. There are five characteristics of a caring, compassionate person. Check yourself. How genuine are you? Are you genuine? Are you humble? By the way, you don't have to wear a sash across your chest marked humble. Just be humble. And the world will see. By the way, let us remind ourselves, being humble does not mean you allow yourself to be a doormat. Oh, he's humble so everybody can walk on you. Not at all. You practice the humility of Christ. Are you there, church? That's what we're talking about. Simplicity. Sincerity. Sweetness. Oh, if God could arrest all the minds in here tonight and help us to have these characteristic. Because if you don't have these, you cannot be a supportive, healthy family member. Being caring is selfless. The Bible says in Philippians 4, or rather Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through strife, help me church, or vain glory. I want to emphasize that. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. In other words, listen to me please. I coined the expression, peacocking is not caring. What do you mean by that? Is there a bird as proud as a peacock? Hello, church. When that peacock wants to show off and it just let out all this, this is me. Do you know that there are some of us, help me with this, Lord, who, when we do anything for anybody, we want the world to know. The Lord says, when you do your arms, when you do good, you should not have to tell the world, I'm going to share something with you which is hypersensitive, but the Spirit bids me do it. I know of a sister who stopped coming to church, and I'm going to tell you the reason. She was not wealthy, she was poor. A more affluent sister gave her a skirt privately, and one day the poor sister wore the skirt to church. And the sister who gave her saw her in it and said to another one, it is I who gave her that skirt. And the one who heard it went back and told the other. And that was the end of her church relationship. She was so disturbed to know that she gave it to me privately. And I wore it and she told someone, oh, I'm the one who gave her, you know? And that person went back to her. Let me tell you something, church. There is nothing more disturbing than to support someone, especially in private, and then to take it, and I don't know if you know the expression here, pinch somebody and say, hello, I'm the one who did it, you know. I gave it to her, I gave it to him. Listen to me, we should seal our good deeds with the Lord. God will honor us openly in his time. Church, let me say this to you. Let's go now, use, use that same principle and go back to this matter of support. How is the support that you demonstrate for those in your life? 
Remember the line? You measure it in a scale of 1 to 10. And deep in your mind, you can reason out the support that I give my son, my wife, my cousin, my aunt, my friend, whomsoever. Is it weak? Scan your mind. There we go again. X-ray your mind. Is it weak? Is it thin, poor, shaky? Or is it average support I give? When in truth, in fact, I can be better. Or can I raise the bar? And the support, I'm always there for him or her. He or she can count on me 24-7. I am there for him or her. What do you mean by 24-7, counselor? I mean... Even if he or she is in the other part of the world, as my family is now, apart from you, my family here, so I didn't want to get you jealous, you know, so I quickly remind you that, yes, I know your family. They're there. But listen to me, please. If tomorrow morning, well, yes, tomorrow morning, at one o'clock, two o'clock, any hour of the night, when I'm in my deepest REM sleep and my phone rings and I see that it is Delphine, my son, Delphine, my daughter, or Andrew, my son-in-law, Esther, my daughter-in-law, or, well, it would not be Jonathan or Nathan or Das because they are young. By the way, Put your family names where I put mine. Because I'm going to go somewhere now. If at any hour of the night, that phone rings, and Elder, when you look at it, and you see that it is, fill in the blank, Elder. When you look at it, it is, fill in the blank. One of two responses you will give which will indicate if you are available unreservedly 24-7. Here comes now one of two responses. First response could probably be, remember, you're in your deep sleep, and the phone rings, and when you look it up, uh, John, what are you calling me at this hour for? Don't you, I'm asleep. You're waking me up, man. One. Two. Phone rings. Uh, John? John? Are you okay? Uh, you woke me to sleep, boy, but talk to me. Are you okay? I'm here. Yes. Which of the two indicates that you are there 24-7. First or second? I'm going to challenge you now. You see, this is now called in sociology a controlled group, which means you are under my control now. And what I just said you know the correct thing that the second one is the truth. So naturally, nobody here would say the first one. But what is the truth? When you leave out of this control setting <laughs> and you go back into your natural habitat, Amen. You got the message. You see, there's something I want to quickly bring on to you. It's called the ministry of presence. What is it? The ministry of presence. You know this story? This is Job. And these are his three friends. The Bible says... 
Then they sat on the ground with him for how long? No one said a word to him. Reason? Because they saw how great his suffering was. What is it called? The ministry of presence. Sometimes to support someone is not necessary that you have an answer. Are you there? It's not necessary that you have to say the right thing. It's not necessary to say anything at all. Just being there. Come on, church. Yeah. Your presence is a ministry, a gift of yourself to another. Can anyone here say, oh yes, I know what it means. I've experienced it when he or she, when my church brother, when my church sister came around and just being there for me is as though it was therapy and my pain was eased because I could see from his eyes, I could feel from her that he or she was there for me. That is support. I need to make a caution quickly. Because Job's friends, being human, did not maintain the ministry of presence totally. Because after they themselves became so overwhelmed by Job's situation, like some of us, the, the exuberance of their ignorance got the better of them. Because some of them began to say, Job, level with us. Tell me the truth, Job. What did you do wrong? Job, listen to me. I believe that what you're going through is as a result of some sin that you commit. Let me apply that. One of my specialties as a counselor is grief management. And I have seen too many times when grieving family members become worse because of some comments that some persons who think they have what to say to them, say to them and only worsens the pain. Sometimes, Lord help me with this one please. Sometimes we as Christians we go around, and when a husband has lost his dear wife, and vice versa, our parent, their child, or whomsoever, some of us have some nice statements to make. Well, you know, God wanted him. Ever heard that one? God wanted him, so he took him. And then a natural family member will feel in the means of, why would God take my husband from me? Don't offer any such suggestion, church. It's better you keep. Are you there? And just pray in your heart for him. Do not offer suggestions and ideas that you do not know. Because sometimes what we do, we worsen the pain. Are you still there? The ministry of presence. If you have to say anything, make it be well seasoned. Pray about it before. Rehearse it if you're not sure. And by the way, since I'm on that note, when a family member or somebody is ill. Don't poke yourself in to find out what is wrong with them. Don't try to ferret. So I wonder what is it that do him? What is the diagnosis? What did the doctor say? What's wrong with him? I don't mean to be insulted, but I'm going to say this to you. It's not your business. You know what is your business? Lift him or her up in prayer. If you need to know, you will know. 
Because sometimes by inquiring and asking, you're only turning things worse. The ministry of presence has a healing power in it. Hello, church? This does not mean that you might not, out of interest, inquire in a very discreet way, depending on the level of relationship you have. But do not get all this, you know, I want to know is what wrong with her. I wonder if it is. That's not Christ-like. Lift him or her up in prayer. Amen. The power of support is this. I am here for you. How about that? So I'm going to ask you to do something. May I pray for you? Right now as you're seated there, I want you to look on this side. I want you, your seatmate, the person who's seated next to you, just in the quietness of the moment, just reach closer to that person and just offer a simple sentence or two prayer on his or her behalf as you're seated there. Just support him or her now. That is to say, you just reach across in the quietness, offer a prayer, sentence or two, a supportive prayer. Let us pray. I need the prayers of those I love While traveling o'er life's rugged way That I may true and faithful be And live for Jesus every day I want my friends to pray for me To bear my tempted soul above And intercede with God I need the prayer of those I Amen. I even saw some embracing after this moment. <coughs> I want to quickly move through this and talk to the church leaders in church board departments, wherever you lead, in institutions. The question is, how caring and compassionate do you believe, this is for the membership and leadership, how caring and compassionate do you believe your church is to erring family members? And by erring family members, I'm talking about those who, in the ignorance, simplicity, immaturity of their life, they slip. They go contrary. 
to the expectations. I'm not talking about persons who calculate to do wrong. I'm talking about the young man, that young lady, that brother, the sister, who, yes, his or her behavior was not always in harmony with the church. And we have to take disciplinary measures sometimes. How much are we there to support such persons after the disciplinary action is taken? Did you hear me, church? I speak to you as a church leader for decades. And I'm going to share something with you. I won't have the time to run through all of these. I'm going to summarize it. Look at me, church leaders. When in that church board, you have to take a disciplinary action against a member who, whose behavior fell out of line and whose behavior would have brought the church into public disrepute. Again, I'm not talking about calculated cases of disturbance. Am I coming clear? I'm talking about behavior. That, that young man, that young lady who fell off. But we have to still take discipline. Watch me, please. And the church board meeting is called. And the church, the board chairman says, brothers and sisters, we have to take or withdraw the right and the fellowship from so-and-so on account of this behavior. Are you still there with me? Watch me, please. This is what I say to my church. Listen, when in true conscience, Helder, when the vote is called, and in true conscience, you have to do this, which means, yes, I agree, take the disciplinary action. This is what I say. When you put up your hand to say, I vote that he or she is to be disciplined, watch me carefully now. I say to you, do not just bring your hand back down after you've taken the vote. When you're bringing your hand down, reach it back out. Amen. Discipline ought to be redemptive, not punitive. So when you say, I agree, you or she is to be disciplined, you have exercised your responsibility. Amen. But you have another responsibility to do, and that is to reach out and, where possible, bring him or her back into the fold. The church is for healing, not to destroy. We're talking about support. Bear ye one another's burden. Don't let it be said that failure, rather success has many relatives, but failure is an orphan. Let that not be said of the church. Did you hear that? Success has many relatives, but failure is an orphan. That should never be said in the church. If we succeed, it's for all of us. When one fails, we seek to restore him or her as he or she is penitent. Notice that clause. Because you cannot restore someone who is not penitent. Are you still there? I close and share a personal story with you. You have met a number of my songs. You have met my paraphrases. I'm going to share with you a poem. I titled it, A Listening Air. Maybe about 30 years ago, or less than that, many years ago, she and I operated a private business. And like 
some private businesses. I'm doing this self-disclosure now. Because sometimes those of us who stand up here, persons tend to get the impression, I wonder if you know by experience what you're talking about. So this business was really going under challenging times. I was a member of the private sector organization and all of that. And one day, my brothers and sisters, when the challenge of the business hit me, I got out of the office, walked, a dis in fact, not walk, meandered, just moving. And I ended up over on a golf course that is in Mandeville, Jamaica. I sat down under a bamboo tree and I sat there and the whole weight of the business and everything just came down on Anthony Gordon. And God must have seen this moment when what happened, happened. This now, what I'm going to tell you is the truth. While I sat there and groaning over the challenges, I saw a piece of paper, just as I'm telling you. I had a little piece of pencil in my hand, and my heart opened up on the paper. What I'm going to share with you is what I wrote then. Everything on the screen is what I wrote that day, seated there alone, I shared with you. In these days of stress and strain, we are caught in the clutches of the rival game. Amidst the roar, we'll wend in pain to reach, to grasp for survival and fame. Listen. Oh, for an earnest listening air in this deafening tumult of strife and care. Thy man for thyself, they say. It's the fittest, you see, who survives the race. They shout, forward to the fray. Who will hear and care for those of lesser pace? Oh, for an earnest listening air on this frightening path stained with hidden tears. Oh, for an earnest listening air tuned with love and confidentiality. Who will stop a friend to chair while talking of life and its reality. Oh, for an earnest listening ear that will brighten the way with comfort and chair. My brothers and sisters, I suggest to you what we need is real, genuine support. The greatest support we can have is from the Lord himself. So we sing as we close, just when I need him, Jesus is near. I trust that you can testify in your own heart. Just when I falter, just when I fear, Ready to help me, ready to chair. At what time, church? 
just when I need him most. Now, while you sing that song, ask yourself, how much am I available to him, to her, to that person in my life, just when he or she needs me? Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fail, ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just when I need him, Just when I need him more, just when I need him more, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. When, just when I need. Just when I need him, Jesus. How true are you, brother and sister? Never forsake all the way. Giving for burdens, pleasure and when are you talking about? Just when I stand to your feet as you sing the last, the chorus, and I'm going to invite you, Pastor. You want to make pray that praying closing prayer for us, for we learn to receive the support of the Lord and to be there to support each other. Sing the chorus, church. Just when I need him Just when I need him Jesus is near to comfort and Just when I need Our Lord and Father in heaven, we are truly grateful this evening for the privilege you've given us to come again to your presence. And we thank you for the warmth of fellowship this evening and the assurance that you're still in the business of helping us. We especially want to thank you for the subject that has been presented to us tonight. How often we ignore, or if we ever attempt, we do it so casually and end up not being as useful in your hands to minister to those that need us most. The mystery ministry of, of presence, as your servant has called it. Such a powerful ministry. Because oftentimes we wish we had a shoulder to lean on. Or we wish we had someone to just sit next to us. Because there are so many who do not know how to minister to us when we need it most. And oftentimes we have people come in our lives and we wish 
they left sooner. And there are those that occasionally come and when they step out, we wish they had stayed longer. And Father, we pray that you will teach us the wisdom needed to just be there for people. Be there for our families, for our children. Who we'll find comfort in the social media rather than find comfort in us. And as a church, tonight we pray, our Father, that you will forgive us where we have gone wrong. And that you will heal the wounds that we have caused by our rash words, rash criticisms, or even pride that we display so often through our words. Father, I pray that someone tonight will go home knowing that something is going to be done to fix it. Even in those homes that are so unbearable, homes where we only tolerate each other, Father, I pray that this ministry will be granted to us and that all, all we will see from now onward is that there will be someone to support us and to understand that we are going through stuff. Glorify yourself in our lives and thank you for your servant. Continue to fill his cup. We will come again looking forward to be filled afresh. Thank you for everyone that came, even our guests that found time to be with us this evening. Bless them accordingly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening once again. Please do bring your prayers to the prayer boxes as we come. We close. We come to the end of our presentations and our sharing this evening. May the Lord richly bless you as we disperse to our various homes. You're most invited tomorrow. Please bring a friend. Yes, we are meeting tomorrow, as you can see on the program. You are most welcome. May God richly bless you as we separate together. Shall we all stand as we say, share together in the grace? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. <laughs>